Mrs. King, in an interview in the New York Times this morning, you say that President Nixon's attitude towards federal support of a proposed memorial for your husband suggests that his administration is motivated by racist attitudes. Did you reach this conclusion solely on the question of the memorial, or is this sort of a last straw in a long series of conclusions? Well, I would have to say not just on the reaction to a memorial, but after many during this administration, um, the fact is that the Nixon administration seems to be following a policy that is designed to create a different mood in the country, maybe a more toward a moderate conservative mood in the country. And on what, we, what, he, what the administration has done in terms of school desegre desegregation uh, and also its whole attitude in the civil rights area, I think that we would have to say that this administration has adopted a policy of go slow and Actually, when Mr. Nixon said the other day in his press conference, when he talked about the two extremes between segregation uh, forever and, segre and integration now, uh, I think this was quite clear that his position of a mill ground is what he plans to follow not only in civil rights but on the war question as well. From CBS New York, in color, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with Coretta Scott King, widow of the slain civil rights leader. Mrs. King's new book, My Life with Martin Luther King Jr., was published this week. Mrs. King will be questioned by CBS News correspondent Ed Rabel, Ben Franklin of the New York Times, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Mrs. King, let me return for a moment, not to the whole question of the Nixon administration, which I'm sure is going to occupy a little time on this program, but to the question of the memorial for your late husband. Uh, this is a $3 million memorial which you're planning in downtown Atlanta. The administration has been negotiating with you for some months, and now it has been broken off. Did you break it off unilaterally, or do you think it really broke off because of disinterested, disinterest on the administration's part? Well, actually, there was a meeting of the Board of Directors, uh, uh, which included family members and close friends, in which we felt that the administration was not going to do anything about the memorial in a serious manner, and that we would have to build this memorial uh, by seeking support from private sources and from individuals of goodwill over this nation. And so that we plan to move in that direction because we feel that it's important to get on with the memorial. There are thousands of people in this nation, I believe, and even throughout the world who would want to see the proper memorial built to Martin Luther King. And we hope to solicit their support and aid. And members of the larger Board of Trustees, uh, I am sure, will want to help us with this. Mrs. King, in view of what you know now, uh, the ideas you form now about the Nixon administration, which perhaps you hadn't formed as well when you wrote your book, I wonder how you feel now about the dedication in the, the front of your book. You dedicate your book to your four children who may live to see the realization of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. Do you feel that the dream can come to pass in their lifetime? Of course, there, there is this constant hope that um, our children, somehow we feel in our lifetime, I think most individuals feel, that the things that they give their lives to may not come to realization, but there's a great satisfaction in having worked toward the ideals that you believe in, and uh, hopefully always that they will come about in the lifetimes of your children. I think that much of what my husband gave his life to uh, has been realized uh, in our lifetime. 
Uh, but I do think that uh, there is much more to be desired. And I don't say that it's not possible, but it means that we are faced with a tremendous challenge now that the, this administration is not giving us much support. Well, do you agree, Mrs. King, with the views expressed by many black leaders that we are, in effect, uh, in a period of retrogression, that the forward movement that was being made during your husband's lifetime has indeed uh, ceased? I think definitely we are, there is a, has been a slowing down of, of progress that was made at the time during my husband's lifetime. There was a great surge. Uh, there was a tremendous, uh, it seemed, goodwill. Uh, at one period, but toward the end of his time, his last year, I think he sensed that there was a, an attitude of, we've gone so far and we're not willing to go any farther right now, you know, because he talked about the myth of time, you know, people who are not willing uh, to move on and change. Uh, and uh, of course, there must be continuous pressure uh, to realize the aspirations of black people, poor people all over this nation. Mrs. King, I should like to continue to pursue the questioning my colleague George Herman began with concerning the memorial. I noticed throughout your book uh, you mentioned that your husband had great disregard for material things. Uh, do you think he would have approved of such a memorial? Uh, there is evidence that there may be a cult of personality growing here, and I just wonder if you think that he would have uh, liked to see such a memorial in Atlanta. Well, I think personally m my husband discouraged any memorial to himself in his lifetime. Uh, as a matter of fact, we began the whole idea of a collecting materials for a library. I started collecting materials during the days of Montgomery. And when we approached him about the idea of a, li of a library and the preservation of his birthplace in his lifetime, uh, he didn't s seem to feel that uh, this was something that was really important to him. Uh, so that I would say that if he were here, but the fact is that he's not here, and I do feel that somehow you have to, uh, in, in order for people to understand what Martin Luther King was his philosophy and what he was trying to do. It's important for generations unbo yet unborn uh, to have a place where they can come and learn. This will be the, the uh, institute that's proposed for nonviolent social change, the Black Studies Program, uh, I think will be the living aspects of the memorial. And uh, also, they are the other parts of the memorial, the entombment, which uh, I think he's entitled to, and the restoration of a birthplace. Uh, these are the things that usually go with great men. And the exhibition hall, where we can uh, have people come and view the uh, view, uh, film strips and uh, other visual aids that will help them to learn and appreciate this period in our history. We don't plan to make our buildings elaborate. I think this is one thing that uh, the family would not want and the people who knew Martin Luther King. But somehow it does require money to do what we want to do. I think the question is, is bound to arise, especially now that this has been publicized as a uh, semi-political affair, it becoming in t in, in involved with the Nixon administration and the whole question of the uh, evaluation of the Nixon administration by blacks and whites alike, the question is bound to arise, how does the Southern Christian leadership as a whole and the Negro community as a whole visualize this memorial? Is this a high priority for the spending of $3 million? Well, I think that uh, it's important to do this memorial, and I think that members of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference would feel this also. It uh, it's important. The programs of SCLC are extremely important to keep pressures, be, you know, on the administration and to keep uh, the problem before the nation. I think it's so important that the conscience of this nation does not sleep on these issues. And I think this is what 
SCLC will be doing. But in a sense, this is what the memorial will be doing too, because as I said, we want this to be a living memorial, not just a memorial of brick, stone, and mortar. Uh, and I think it is as important as any other programs that we are planning. One aspect of the memorial uh, is will be a, we hope it will become part of the memorial, is the Southern Rural Action Development, the Southern Rural Action Program, which is designed uh, to create new life in the rural South for black people. And these programs uh, have taken the form of people-owned enterprises, which will give jobs to people in these communities who have heretofore left these communities and migrated to urban centers. Uh, some of the, particularly the leaders in these communities, have had sometimes have been forced out of the communities because they have given forthright leadership and. This enables them to stay here and continue to work and also earn a decent living for themselves and their families and continue the process of really developing the whole community, not only economically but politically as well. And I think this, we hope, will become a part. It's already in process. We, it's a matter of formally making it a part of the memorial. Mrs. King, at the recent Southern Christian Leadership Conference Convention in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, Ralph Abernathy, the president of SELC, made an open appeal uh, for persons who were contributing money to the movement to contribute to the SCLC rather than earmarking their funds for the memorial. Is it possible that uh, the uh, campaign to raise $3 million for this memorial could somehow uh, detract from the work of the SCLC? Well, I don't see. I think there's enough uh, money for both, and I think that um, there are individuals who want to give to the memorial, individuals who want to give to the program of SCLC. I think that uh, if people know that there is an opportunity to do both, those people who feel strongly about the memorial will contribute to the memorial. And certainly I am for contributing to both because I think they're both very important. Mrs. King also included in your criticism of the Nixon administration what you call token reforms for the poor and a retreat on desegregation. And you said constant pressures must be applied. What kind of pressures are you talking about? Well, I think that what we have been doing over the past uh, 15 years since the desegregation, school desegregation uh, des decision, and in our movement for the past 13 years, we must continue to define the issues as which, which we have been doing to uh, dramatize them. Uh, we've done it through massive demonstrations. I think we must continue to our marches. We must continue our uh, picketing. We must continue our sit-ins. We must continue all forms of pressure that nonviolent pressure and, and trying to bring about real meaningful gains in terms of creating life, new life for people, the poor people of this nation. Mrs. King, who is we? When I speak of we, I'm talking about not only our movement, but all persons of goodwill. I'm, I'm speaking basically of the organized part uh, of our movement that's organized. I think we have been doing this in a sense. We've done it and, and people usually think of only the marches and the things that, uh, the dramatic things, but I think we've done it in voter registration, for instance. My, my question is aimed at what is the role of Coretta King in this we? Oh, I plan to be involved definitely in this, I, as I have been. I participated uh, during the 13 years, uh, 12 and a half years of my husband's life and since that time with the marches that we've had in the last pa in the last year, I did go to Charleston in support of hospital workers there because I be believe very strongly in the right of these black women to earn a decent living for their families. I feel very strongly uh, about the the fact that so many women have this tremendous responsibility of of 
caring for the family and not having the means with which to do it. I will continue to support them. I will continue to participate uh, in peace demonstrations as I have done in the past. Now, now that the book is, is written and in, in sort of out of your system and you've, you're free from that particular work, are you planning to step up your activities? Will you take some kind of leadership position? Uh, I am, first of all, I want to say that I have my four children and I, I think that uh, with uh, that being my first responsibility and a top priority as far as my own programming is concerned, uh, I will spend as much time as possible working, um, stepping up my activities as you have said, so in support of poor people, hospital workers, other poor people, uh, con uh, getting people into the building trades and the construction crafts and so on and also in the peace movement I am serving as one of the chairman for the mobilization on November the 4th, 13th 14th and 15th and also I will be uh, speaking and participating in the October 15th mobilization of students calling for a moratorium uh, on the Vietnam War. Mrs. King we've been told that after you finished your book that there was the possibility that you and Mrs. Robert F. Kennedy might form a women's peace organization. Is that uh, likely? Well, at the moment, there is no um, plan for this, but I would hope that Mrs. Robert Kennedy would join with me in efforts that I will be making. I definitely will be involved very much because I feel very strongly that this is a war that has to come to an end. Will this be a separate organization? Uh, I am not involved in organizing anything separate at the moment, but I would hope to appeal to all women because I think women have a special role to play because the war affects them more poignantly than almost any other group, their children, their sons, their husbands, and, and bringing up your family uh, you have a responsibility, I think, to instill in your children a sense of values. And one of the things that I think we are taught as a Christian democratic nation is that you do not kill other people. You know, it's, I, I think the moral issue is a very strong one with me. And uh, I feel that until women come to the point where they feel strongly enough against the kind of brutality, the kind of killing that's been going on, then we, we will perhaps continue this. I think they have a very strong role to play, and I would encourage women everywhere. Mrs. King, in a recent press conference, uh, South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond said that for the first time now in modern history, the South has a voice in Washington, and that voice is being heard. Senator Thurmond was speaking of himself. You are a Southerner. Does Senator Thurman speak for you? And what kind of influence do you think he has in Washington? Well, he most certainly doesn't speak for me. And I would say that he doesn't speak for the other black people, that uh, millions of black people throughout this nation. And I would hope that uh, white people, many white people of goodwill, uh, he's not speaking for. Um, I, I think there's no question that uh, the good senator has quite an influence in Washington, and I believe that uh, we are feeling the effects of this uh, in the policy of the present administration. Uh, I would like to say that there, when Mr. Nixon spoke about uh, two extremes, it seems to me that a um, President of the United States uh, should cannot afford to take a position of a middle ground. You are saying you, in a sense, that you don't believe in in following the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, that you don't believe uh, in integration. I think the two administrations before that I've been, uh, you know, involved with certainly made it clear that this is not the policy that integration is the law of the land and this is what we believe in. And when you say you are going to take a middle ground, 
I think this really leaves the way clear for people to come and say, we're not going to comply. And I think he, sh he, he is, is obligated, it seems to me, to this nation to take a strong moral position on this question. There's no, there is no middle ground between right and wrong. There's no middle ground between integration and segregation. Uh, do, you, do you give him any points for perhaps cooling off the white backlash in certain segments of the country? You know, we've had a long cooling off period, and I think that uh, in all fairness, I think we've had long enough. I think, uh, what about these other people, uh, the black people and the other minorities at this point? Uh, I think well, it's time. Well, I only ask because, Mrs. King, as you know, it's very popular these days to talk about the worries of polarization of the nation. Is that a worry to you, or do you think that this is, this is a good way of, of, or at least a way, of achieving what you think should be achieved? Well, I think what has happened is that the polarization has been encouraged because of the policy of this administration. Of course, I think there was this tendency before this administration came. Uh, into office, but I think that it has been encouraged, and the, the, this administration is continuing to encourage this polarization, and I think that it's so important at this point, if this nation is going to be a nation which really can set an example to, and we, 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 we pride ourselves in being the kind that, you know, we believe in all of these things. We believe in love and justice and mercy. We believe in brotherhood. But we have not practiced this. And I think that there is just, at this time in our history, it's just shameful that we cannot come to the point where we as a nation, that we will not tolerate any form of injustice, any form of inequality and that all people right now must have the basic rights of life, liberty, and equality. Mrs. King, in view of what you've just said and the failure of the dream to be realized at present, I found remarkable in your book uh, the lack of uh, very much uh, unpleasant uh, commentary about individuals or events. Uh, you mentioned several places in your book the role played by the Federal Bureau of Investigation in preventing disorder and protecting your husband's life uh, at times of extreme crisis. Were you ever aware that at least certain agents of the FBI were spreading uh, uh, scurrilous uh, stories about your husband among newsmen and others? Well, um, I must say that there was um kind of, we knew that they were there to give protection, but we never felt that uh, that this was, we never took it seriously, let me say, um, because we realized that many of the agents in the South uh, were Southerners and products of their environment, and we could not take seriously the fact that they really were concerned about my husband's welfare. Uh, although I must say that uh, it did make us feel a little bit better that there were some persons of, who were supposed to enforce the law on the scene. Uh, I must say that I had an awareness that in as much as he was being followed all the time that there must have been uh, an effort to be involved in all that he was doing. And I didn't, I wasn't always sure that this effort was an effort that was, that would serve the purposes of our movement. Mrs. King, because of the work of your husband and other black leaders, do you feel that there is growing up now in America a new generation of black children who have black pride, who are of a different mentality than the people who grew up in your time? Well, I think so, very definitely. I think that uh, that even in the period in which I grew up, 
there were many of us who had our, who knew who we were. Uh, I think this is true of, of many of the young people who grew up in the South. Um, even though we grew up in a system of segregation, uh, we had a sense of our heritage. Uh, in many of our schools, we were taught Negro history. Um, this was not true always of, of children who grew up in the North um, and who were taught by white teachers uh, who had a very mm. little sense of, of this heritage. And the new children? And I think the new children now have an even greater sense of their identity because of the effort that has been made recently. We have less than a minute left, but I wanted to ask you, you painted rather a gloomy picture of the lot of the black community under President Nixon. Do you think that if his term stretches, for example, to eight years, there's likely to be real trouble? I think that we, this administration is really asking for trouble unless it changes its policy. And I can't predict what kind of trouble this will, is going to be. I think your prediction is as good as mine. But I know that the black community is very unhappy. And uh, it's like the idea whose time has come. And we are not going to stop our efforts. We are going to continue to press forward. Thank you very much, Mrs. King, for being with us here today on Face the Nation. We'll have a word about next week's guest in a moment. That's Billy. He's pretty handy to have around. Steve, home from college. Barbie, looking after her brother Timmy. Debbie, who will soon graduate from high school. Susan, our youngest. And my wife, Peggy, who looks after all of us. And that's me, Bill Tolman, with a friend of mine you might recognize. You know, I didn't really mind losing those courtroom battles. But I'm in a battle right now I don't want to lose at all. Because if I lose it, it means losing my wife and those kids you just met. I've got lung cancer. So take some advice about smoking and losing from someone who's been doing both for years. If you don't smoke, don't start. If you do smoke, quit. Don't be a loser. Today on Face the Nation, Coretta Scott King was interviewed by CBS News correspondent Ed Rabel, Ben Franklin of the New York Times, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Next week, the newly elected minority leader of the Senate, Senator Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania, will face the nation. A side of the Vietnam War you've never seen. Young businessmen making $200 a week panhandling. These and other fascinating features will be highlighted on 60 Minutes with Mike Wallace and Harry Reisner, Tuesday night. Face the Nation originated in color from CBS New York. This program was recorded. CBS News national correspondent Eric Severide has a conversation with Dean Acheson. Don't miss it. Today at 6, 5 Central Time on CBS.